I'm going to talk about the central role of spiritual perception in the evolution of Homo sapiens. This is an aspect of our development that's often sidelined, sniffed at, explained away as a kind of byproduct of the relentless drive to survive and thrive back on the savannah. But new research is showing that spiritual perception and awareness of invisible and immaterial worlds always was central to what drove Homo sapiens to evolve. Maybe even what makes Homo sapiens distinctive. Contested area, all this is a contested area. By distinctive, I don't mean that other kinds of homos didn't have related perceptions, but there's good reason to think that Homo sapiens developed spiritual perception to an extraordinary degree, as in fact can be seen now in modern religions, but that it reaches all the way back. Now, it's work that's been done by figures like Robin Dunbar, the anthropologist who has argued that trans states are intimately connected to the development of the human brain and that that is part of our evolutionary story. Another anthropologist called Augustin Fuentes has been arguing recently that belief and imagination is key to human development because if you think about it, technologies from flint axes to use of okras, clothing, um, cooking food, the manipulation of fire, these technologies take millennia to evolve, in fact. They don't just happen, as it were, in one iteration of the technology cycle, much as we're used to today. And so the question becomes, what keeps Homo sapiens at what is seen as technological development all along. And Agustin Fuentes has been stressing that it must be the more immediate relationship that Homo sapiens had to the spiritual worlds that they realized they were embedded in. I'll come back to that. And then the third really important figure in this new story is that of Robert Bella. He argued that there's been far too much stress put on what he called online time, the time that Homo sapiens needs to survive, hunting, providing safety, shelter and so on, and that offline time was perhaps far more common for much of human history than we realise, and it was in this space that serious play could take root in human cultures, and that in a way that became a more important feature of human life than the business of survival. And in particular, human play is about relating to absent others, to ancestors, to spiritual worlds that gradually opened up to our ancestors. So these figures, amongst others, are putting down the evidence that challenges the dominant narrative, which is one based on the need to survive fabrications, um, fictions, as Noah Yovel Harari calls them in Sapiens, an idea that just can't stack up because if Homo sapiens became the fiction-telling creature able to communicate lies as if they were truths, then how can it be that the latest stories based on science are any different? We wouldn't even know. These new figures in the story of Homo sapiens are arguing there's a realism to our spiritual lives. Immaterial evidence, of course, doesn't survive the evidence that illuminates the mental lives of our ancestors, but it's easy, therefore, to assume it didn't really play much of a part. Um, and so just go for the material evidence that survives and base your story on that, which is what many of the big historians of human development go for now. Um, but a lot can be inferred. So let's tell that story now. Homo sapiens emerges maybe up to 300,000 years ago 
as one of many homo species that almost day by day at the moment it's becoming clearer, um, co-lived together, um, shared environments, maybe even interbred. I'm thinking about Homo neanderthalis, of course, here, and other species. What particularly seems to have marked Homo sapiens out is having larger brains, although when you do the deep dive into this research, it's often remarked that, in fact, the brains that our ancestors who painted the Chauvet caves, for example, were actually larger than modern brains now. Um, the brain isn't everything when it comes to mental life and mind, not by a long stretch. But of course it's where mentality touches materiality and so is always going to play a part in the archaeological story of Homo sapiens. So what marked this new species, the wise one, as we've called ourselves out? Figures like Harari have talked about fictions and language. Others point to imaginative powers, um, the, the, the way that ideas came to shape human life and I have no doubt that that plays a part but I think what is the key element is the capacity to wander about the world around and actively explore and engage with what that wander seems to open up I and mean, it's quite clear that other homos even actually other species of animal know about wander and um, research has been done on macaque monkeys in Gibraltar and show that they will gaze and seemingly enjoy a sunset, even when, for example, there's a ripe fig tree nearby which would normally distract them. So this is not about distinctiveness in terms of experience. It's about distinctiveness in being able to engage with experience. That is what Homo sapiens in particular seem to be able to do more than other homos around and about. So the idea would be that they became particularly adept at engaging with this spiritual commons, the kind of pulse, the vitality of life, the sense that there are all sorts of entities and beings around and about, as well as the ones that can be seen with the empirical senses. This would have been done through increasingly elaborate rituals, through the telling of myth, the use of trance to induce altered states of consciousness, music, of course, which is closely related to that, and in time, articulated beliefs. Um, it's thought that this actually comes rather late in the day and that an embodied, shared, communal sense of exploration through things like ritual and music was perhaps the dominant way that the spiritual commons was engaged with for most of Homo sapiens' history. But as some remark, it's as accurate to call Homo sapiens Homo spiritualis as marking a point of departure that has led to us today. Now again, that is a controversial thing to say. Any kind of claim to human uniqueness can be instantly challenged. But the way that Dunbar has argued the case is by looking at brain size and arguing that it's intimately related to what he calls degrees of intentionality. Now this is the capacity to hold cognitive objects in mind of increasing complexity. So for example, it's thought that Australopithecus, the predecessor to the Homo line, was able to have maybe two or three degrees of intentionality. So this would be called theory of mind knowing that another fellow has an interior life like your own. And the evidence for this, for example, would be with the fossil discovery known as AL333, where a group of Australopithecus were found together. And the evidence seems to suggest that they were attacked, maybe by a wild cat, and that whilst not all were killed in the attack, all the members of that clan stayed together and subsequently died as a result. And that's the kind of thing that theory of mind can do. Again, it, it maybe isn't even is observed in other animals as well, who will relate and attach and stay with others in their tribes, in their groups, even to the point of death. So these degrees of intentionality gradually nudge up from two or three to perhaps four or five. And the theory is that around a million years ago, Homos like Heidelbergensis and Neanderthalis 
achieved four degrees of intentionality. So that meant they could say things like, I know that you believe that we together should build a fire. You get the sense of the four there. I, you, together, build something external to us both. And of course that very substantially increases social engagement, um, it increases the complexity of communities, um, it develops the sense of being able to engage with the environment, it leads to new kinds of intelligence not previously seen on the planet. Now this is often explained as being beneficial for social bonding and there's no doubt that that's the case. The comparisons often made with chimpanzees who bond through grooming and nitpicking um, and that that takes time and so it limits the size of the troop because of the time it takes. And so homos who could bond by sharing inner lives develop much more efficient ways of holding together. And so someone like Robin Dunbar would propose that say Heidelbergensis or Neanderthalis could form bonds of maybe up to a hundred or so individuals. Now I've no doubt that this is a byproduct of being able to communicate, probably speak in this way, but it begs the question of why that was desirable to do so. And this is where the idea of inner life, interiority, spirituality, um, the sense that there are invisible worlds within which the visible world is embedded. And that could be the reason why language was such a compelling thing to be able to engage in. It was a way of more consciously and actively sharing in these interiorities, the inside of the whole world. And then as a byproduct, brought social bonding and so on as well, which aided survival and the increase of group size. You need to have the immediate appeal of existing in this way, so that then in time, maybe over many centuries, the larger groups and ways of life can evolve that have the secondary benefits of survival. As Bella would put it, the offline drives the online, not the other way around. The interest, the curiosity, the engagement drives the survival, the success of the species and not the other way around. The evidence for this is that species such as Neanderthalis have beautiful objects and tools that are much more elegant than pure utility would demand. And this is so significant because it implies that they were able to hold beautiful objects in mind, moreover beautiful objects that didn't exist in the world around them. They had enormous imaginative powers as well as what's required to produce the objects such as collaboration, the techniques to do so and so on. They can see more than is visible in the world and again the suggestion is that that comes about because they had seen more than is invisible in the world and so wanted to replicate that as a way of participating with invisible worlds and other dimensions of reality that had opened up to them because of their cognitive capacities. Who knows the desire to bring new things into the world may well have been part of what they experienced in the spirit world as its novelty and newness opened up to them. And maybe even Neanderthals used symbols to do this. And this is one of the contested areas in the archaeology now. But the difference between a symbol and a sign is that whereas a sign has mostly practical benefit, the yellow stripes on a wasp say keep away, that's a sign. Whereas symbols are like portals into other worlds and so the marks on the sides of caves that have been proposed as Neanderthal art rather than just signs may well be part of this nascent capacity to use symbols to enter other worlds along with ritual and music and dance and so on. It also seems likely that Neanderthals could share with communities that weren't physically present. Their use of language and the four orders of intentionality didn't just sustain the bonds of maybe up to a hundred individuals but also extended that to reach to the departed as well and Neanderthals may well have been the first homos to have said things like our ancestors give us this land. A very remarkable imaginative development 
when you let that sink in, our ancestors may have given us this land. This is a new relationship to the environment, much beyond pure survival. And again, that sense of vitality, experienced all day, every day, all night, every night, must have woven ritual right into the heart of Homo's life together. Everything would have been pervaded by ritual. It wasn't, as we are inclined to think of things today, as if ritual was an exceptional part of life, kind of bolted onto the rest of it. No, as work with Indigenous peoples today shows, ritual shapes every single part of life. Um, sleeping, rising, uh, raising children, hunting in the forest, walking across the desert plains. They're all ritualised activities and that's very much how these peoples managed to do that. Um, they navigated by myths that didn't just tell them things of practical use but knew how to relate to the world through which they were moving as well. So they could sustain themselves emotionally and mentally as much as physically and practically. It's why this designation of homo spiritualitis for homo sapiens makes sense because by the time you get to homo sapiens, ritual was already replete in homo neanderthalists life and maybe many other kinds of homos as well. Now there is the question here of whether rituals are revealing real truths about reality or are fabricating myths. Again, books like Sapiens by Harari are clear that they believe it's fabrications that have this survival advantage. But that gets unsettled when you realise that survival is a byproduct of engagement. And a key issue here in the science is the question of niches. This is the idea in evolutionary biology that evolution explores niches in the world. So, for example, fish in their many forms have evolved ways of exploring and living in the niche that would be called water. Or most birds have explored ways of surviving and thriving in the niche that would be called the air. Now where this gets a bit more contentious is, is are the immaterial niches in reality as well. And again the dominant narrative would be that human beings make niches, fabricate niches that they then um, live in. They don't discover and extend niches. But there's an important strand of work by serious scientists that suggests that that can't be so, that the mere fabrication of niches can't be so. This was actually explored a long time ago by Erwin Schrödinger in his famous essay, What is Life? And he discusses niches there and argues that when you ask what life is, you see it's always a collaboration with the world around. It's always a co-creation with the immaterial, inanimate side of life. And so he argues there that niches are partly explored, but they're only explored because they're initially discovered. And this has been taken up more recently by biologists such as Simon Conway Morris, who have argued that niches such as value must exist in reality, that certainly Homo sapiens and no doubt other homos discovered as well and that they entered into them mentally rather than practically, and that that was what deeply influenced the emergence of homo cultures and ways of life. So this is to say that evolution is, alongside everything else it might be, a discovery mechanism. It's a story of exploration of the environment, not merely survival in the environment and for homos and ultimately homo sapiens. The spiritual exploration of reality is central and fundamental. We are meaning seeking but also meaning discovering creatures, not merely meaning making creatures. And you know this is needed for science as well if it's not to fold in on itself. If science is not a meaning discovering activity but merely a meaning making activity, then all the claims of science just tumble and fall. And it also explains why there's a meaning crisis when, in the last century or so, um, the idea that meaning exists in the world has been profoundly challenged. Uh, that causes serious problems for our species, but I want to return to that. What is also fascinating is when there are encounters with indigenous tribes now, and things are seen in reality that the modern mind, as in 
modern in the last three or four hundred years post the birth of science mind can't see. Um, this is described very fascinatingly by figures like Daniel Everett who travelled to the Amazon and worked with the Paraha people and he will talk about incidents where a whole tribe can see a spirit on the opposite bank of a river and he can see nothing. It suggests that through their life together, through their shared myths, awareness, deep integration with the life of the forest, not, not merely practical use of the forest, they're able to discern presences and entities that have been lost, certainly in Daniel Everett's case. And another figure who's explored this is Bruce Parry, who's made films about indigenous people, particularly the Paraha, and he has captured on film very fascinating shots where when say a group is working out where to settle for the night they don't as it were scan the environment and make practical decisions about the boughs of the trees being right the right materials being around they speak directly to the spirits to the gods that are around and about and know where to settle because of that they're engaging with the life of the forest in a different way to how we would now and this is almost like an echo or memory, I think, of how Homo spiritualis first emerged and evolved. So let's now address particularly what makes Homo sapiens different from Neanderthals, Heidelbergensis, no doubt many others, since this is a gradual development with takeoff points rather than the sudden emergence of something completely distinctive and new. And Dunbar's work would suggest that, again, it's linked to this orders of intentionality and that with Homo sapiens, five and more orders of intentionality emerged, leading to new cognitive sophistication and new kinds of intelligence, which then have many ramifications in terms of the species. So five would be being able to say something like, I think you believe that I imagine that together we should build a fire. So in addition to what Neanderthals might have said to each other, there's been this introduction of a fifth element that I imagine. I think you believe that I imagine that together we should build a fire. And that small extra recursion leads to an expansion of imaginative and spiritual engagement with the world around and about. So what this means in practice is that more complex stories can be told, more nuance can be dived into, um, larger groups can form as well. Dunbar reckons this would have extended human groups up to maybe around 150, remembered now of course in Robin Dunbar's number. Um, and also it leads to the capacity to self-transcend not just to live alongside absent others, such as ancestors, but also to introduce a kind of verticality into human community. Remember, we're talking now about Homo sapiens proper. And this has been observed by anthropologists such as Morris Bloch, who notices that humans live with what he calls double identities. Um, for example, in a Malagasy group, he observed that a tribal leader became very aged. He knew him over quite a long period of time, this leader. And that even though his practical use to the tribe declined and then disappeared altogether, so he spent most of the day lying on a couch covered in blankets, the symbolic importance of this elder remained for the tribe. And so whilst the elder could no longer carry out the rituals, he was always consulted and asked for his blessing, as it were, for rituals to be undertaken. So what this suggests is that this elder represents a kind of vertical presence into the spirit world for the tribe, as much as offering a blessing on the ritual that was going to be undertaken. And so you start to get the notion of hierarchies emerging with Homo sapiens. Hierarchies that bring down divine reality as much as reach up into divine reality. Remember, hierarchies always have this two-way process. It also makes it clear that Homo sapiens really were engaging in art. You know, if there is some debate about what Neanderthal marks on a cave were about, were they signs, were they symbols, this notion of self-transcendence, um, double sides, um, the hierarchy, means that art clearly can become a portal into other worlds. And 
the immediacy which we, we feel that when you see the images, say, at the Chauvet Cave and many others. Um, I think that there's no mystery about this, really. They still speak to us, even if we find it hard to articulate what about, because we share the same experience of engaging with spiritual vitalities, even though it can be lost in the modern world. Now, this also has lots of practical outcomes that are new as well. For example, Agustin Fuentes proposes that it's deeply linked to the idea of storage and surplus. Um, if you think about it, these are not obvious things as concepts to have. You know, clearly other animals store things. But the idea that you might create a culture around surplus, where surplus is, say, celebrated in feasting, and you also become aware of fasting and poverty. This is new, and the newness of it arises not by some kind of random accident of the imagination, but because it's a reflection of the spiritual abundance that Homo sapiens was increasingly engaged with through this pervasive, ritualised way of life. They saw the fecundity of spirit worlds, able to reproduce, reach into even the infinity of the heavens, and so wanted that to be reflected in their own more immediate and tangible lives. And so notions like feasting and surplus really start to get going. Dunbar calls it thinking big and says that this is distinctive of who we now are. And it has an impact as well on technological development. Um, I mean, think of it like this. Um, Homo heidelbergensis, for example, as is known by the discoveries of hand axes in southern England, didn't change their technology for at least 800,000 years. They learned how to nap flints, and then that was it. Nothing more happened. They didn't produce the more beautiful, rounded and shaped tools that came later. And the idea is that that stasis is a result of the limited cognitive capacities of Heidelbergensis. It didn't have particularly this extra imaginative quality that could feel it might more actively, with agency, with consciousness, engage in spiritual vitalities. And so treated Knapp flints reverentially, and these flints are discovered in particular sites and are discarded ritually, it seems, but not enough to want to develop the technologies and hence the hand axes remained unchanged for this vast amount of time, far longer, of course, than Homo sapiens has existed as a species. There's even a proposal that this is what led to the extinction of Neanderthals. Um, it wasn't, at this stage at least, that Homo sapiens were especially violent, but rather spiritual notions like surplus weren't shared by Neanderthals. Um, they may have even found it quite taboo to store sacred animals in jars, um, to take more from the forest than was immediately required. But of course, without that capacity to build surplus, communities stay much the same size, whereas sapiens with surplus could start to grow. And so not through violence, but merely outpopulating the Neanderthals around and about they eventually went extinct over many thousands of years. It's a kind of emerging dark side to the development of spiritual capacities by Homo sapiens inadvertently at this stage. I don't think it's warfare-like violence at all. That takes the development of something else, the development of ideologies. And that, I think, doesn't really come until maybe the last 10,000 years or so with the development of civilizations. Um, the evidence for this would be, say, looking at indigenous communities where egalitarianism is the norm, things are shared. And the significance of that is that whilst there might be raiding parties to steal surpluses, there wouldn't be the enormously extended hierarchies with figures like kings um, and in time even emperors at the top who want to extend their ideology and rule over very large groups of people. That is what's required for truly violent warfare. I think it's these spiritual perceptions that also lead to what's called the agricultural revolution. And again, this is a bit of a bone to pick with people like Harari and his book Sapiens, where he calls 
the agricultural revolution, history's biggest fraud. It's a kind of witty idea that wheat and grasses colonised our lives to make them more successful species on the planet. But again, what this overlooks is the length of time it would take to develop an agricultural way of life. And so the question is, what sustains the you know many generations that it takes, for example, to develop a new species of grass? And this is where the spiritual element comes in. Um, someone who wrote about this, and I think he got it right in spirit, was William Irvin Thompson. And he, for example, argues that shamans, who would have been a feature of this ritual way of life by now, developed sophisticated ways of relating animals, for example, and plants to the cosmos. So the example that he develops is the idea that the bull's horns would have been seen to replicate the shape of the, the moon in its cycle. And so attending to the life of bulls would have become part of the ritual engagement with the cosmos, with the inside of the whole world. And then as a byproduct, that would have led to the increasing domestication of cattle. And again, the point here is that the immediate ritual engagement is what keeps the longer term, many generations, maybe even hundreds of years, gradual domestication of cattle going. And so similarly with agriculture, the idea is it's born out of a ritual engagement with the world around and about and eventually produces these practical outcomes such as being able to grow crops. So when Harari calls it history's biggest fraud, he's actually concealing far more than he reveals. And of course, it's part of the anti-religious rhetoric that shapes books like his. I think this new story also helps to explain settlement, um, as has been realised with the discovery of Gebekli Tepe in Turkey. The building of shrines at sacred places precedes settlement. So temples are not a function of cities, but maybe cities are a function of temples. And this new story would say that that's because particular places become deeply associated with encountering gods and spirits and so on. And so a whole collection of people can organise to put up temples like are found at Gebekli Tepe. And then in time, settlement follows on from that. Um, Çatalhöyük, the other famous site from modern day Turkey, seems to show how egalitarianism gradually emerged into more abrupt kinds of hierarchy. Um, the earliest layers of Çatalhöyük seem to show actually the collapse of the older egalitarian society. So we're now moving into the period that is on the cusp of history rather than prehistory, you know, the kind of period in the last 10,000 years or so um, when you start to have civilizations emerging and along with it religions as we would now understand them built on doctrinal structures which are as it were completely in the invisible world and so in modern times become disconnected from the natural world leading in part to many of the problems that we face now. That's another story and so just to draw some conclusions from this new account of Homo Spiritualis. It's not utility that has driven our evolution. Practical benefits have come as the byproduct of this wanting to engage with way more than we immediately see through ritual, through dance, through trance, because there are spiritual niches that can be discovered and explored and incorporated into human life. Hence the many beautiful objects that are associated with Neanderthals, but in particular with Sapiens. And the awareness of supernatural beings as well, symbolised in figures like the Lion Man. And then this shapes a culture which includes things like feasting and the idea of surplus and trade. Concepts like plenty and poverty, as well as activities such as farming and settlement. All these things follow from being Homo Spiritualis. So the significance of this now is that spirituality is basic to our nature. It is what leads to the richness of our mental lives and imaginative lives. It's not a byproduct. It's not mere superstition that we should somehow outgrow. 
Rather, we should continue to dive into it, to explore it, to develop it, to incorporate it into our lives, because it's precisely that which connects us with the rest of the world. And when it disappears from our life, the risk is that our civilizations flounder.